<laughs> but first, I am very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Laura Musikansky. Now, imagine my surprise when I looked up uh, happiness research on the web and found that Seattle is home to the Happiness Alliance. Believe it or not, a grassroots organization that's dedicated to improving society by understanding the factors that lead to happiness for individuals and communities. Uh, I thought, now here's an organization that can help information architects understand what happiness is and maybe, hopefully, uh, point us in the right direction to bringing happiness to our user communities. So Laura is the executive director of the Happiness Alliance and she has graciously agreed to be our kickoff speaker for this inaugural World IA Day Seattle. Please join me in welcoming Laura Musikansky. So um, um, I've been working in, in the field of happiness coming out of uh, sustainable Seattle and working in the field of sustainability now for about four years. And I see, sort of see my job as, um, in the big scheme of things, changing the world because our goal is to have a new economic paradigm to really change our, our economy from money-based to well-being-based. Um, in another way, more realistically, it's really conveying the message of what is happiness to you? How does that relate to others? And then how do we bring about a systematic change? So let's start today by um, doing something that John Hallowell does. I learned from John Hallowell. He's up in Vancouver, um, British Columbia. He's one of the co-authors of the, ha the World Happiness Report um, and is a very well-known happiness researcher. This is what he does. He's an academic, so I can borrow it from him when he starts his talks as he gets everybody to sing. So let's do this twice, but let's do the, the clapping and stomping and like wake your bodies up a little bit. <laughs> so, all right, you guys ready? You ready for this? If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Okay, this time super loud and stomp your feet too, okay? If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, stomp your feet. Woohoo! Let's do it with you. Woohoo! <laughs> All right, so the next, the next piece is where you need the piece of paper and the pencil, and we're gonna do a little, um, we're gonna do a little, um, a little exercise. And th there's gonna be three different subjects. You'll see them up on the screen so soon. There'll be three different subjects. You're gonna have 30 seconds for each one. I need to grab my phone and be able to time you. Um, and you can cheat on this, okay? So the three different subjects are things, activities, and people, and the query is, what makes you happy? All right, so what are the 10 things that make you happy? What are the 10 activities that make you happy? And what are the 10 people who make you happy? And I'm gonna give you 30 seconds for each one and see if you can list 10, all right? So, and remember you can cheat, you don't have to. <laughs> all right, so I'll give you 30 seconds for 10 things that make you happy, so go. And stop. Okay, now 30 seconds for 10 activities that make you happy, and you get to choose what an activity is. So, and go. And stop. Okay, and 30 seconds for 10 people who make you happy, and go. And stop. Okay, so for this part, let's just get to know each other a little bit, and if you would turn to the person on each side of you, or at least two people, and just both of you share one of the things that's on your list with each other, so does that make sense? So go ahead. <laughs> All right, okay, so how many of you could list 10 things? How many of you could list 10 things? All right, and how many of you could list 10 activities? Okay, and how many of you could list 10 people? Okay, if you just keep your hands a little higher and turn around and look around, and when we had the others, there were just a, maybe a couple of hands <laughs> of people who could list. So what, w this, this is actually very meaningful. This is important findings in the happiness research that if, we, if the, the talk were to be just, Laura, come up and say in one word what makes people happy, guess what that word would be? Anybody want to guess? Just one word. Yeah, others, exactly, yeah. So, so this goes to that happiness is actually happening, not just in the personal piece, which is termed positive psychology, and have you, if you're familiar with the positive psychology movement, and Martin Seligman, 
and um, Mikhail, Mikhail, da, 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 who did, wrote the book Flow, they really started the whole, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Does anybody know how to say his name? Say it again. What? <laughs> say it 10 times fast. <laughs> So that, that, that's the positive psychology movement. And now that is being married in the field with the movement for a new economic paradigm, which sort of started with the anti-globalization, but really has gone into a very positive way, like the psychology movement, with Bhutan. Anybody here been to Bhutan? No, but people know where Bhutan is, right? Yeah. So Bhutan is a small kingdom that's above India, um, next to Nepal. And there, 40-some years ago, this 17-year-old king was asked, what are you going to do to improve your, your country's gross domestic product? The, it was then gross national product, the sum of all products and goods um, produced in a year. And his re response was, gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. And there they take their very king very seriously. They actually use gross national happiness, the subjective and objective measure, which we'll talk about, to inform their policy, to inform their allocation of resources. And there's a paper that I wrote, just wrote um, last year that you can read if you want to read the actual policies. It's the first paper that really looks at what are the actual policies that have been, impl put, been put into place because of a subjective indicator of well-being. From there, um, about um, in 2009, then President of France, Sarkozy, issued what's called the Stieglitz Report. Anybody beside Eldon, who is one of the co-founders of Happiness Alliance, know about the Stieglitz Report? So the Stieglitz Report was issued in France by Amanitri Sen, Bacuzzi, and, Mar um, and um, what's his name? Jeffrey, um, it's a name that you all know. So um, that the Stieglitz Report was issued, and that, that report said that gross domestic product is not a sufficient measure for governments to be determining what the happiness of their well and the well-being of their people is, and urged countries to start using alternative measures. The UN followed suit. They issued a resolution with the, the same thing, and then there was a conference, a high-level conference at the United Nations in, um, was that 2010, 2011? I was honored to be one of the people who got to attend that conference. We were, we were commanded, essentially, by um, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, and the then Prime Minister of Bhutan to launch a happiness movement, which we were essentially already doing. At the same time, the United Kingdom has been using happiness measurements to inform their policy. They've done their second round of a sub using a subject of a survey within all of the UK to understand what is the happiness and well-being of the people in the UK. And here in the United States, so essentially there's lots happening in terms of, I haven't gone over, this is often a, a bigger part of the talk, but there's lots happening um, in Europe, in Asia, and then here in the United States, it's, it's largely grassroots and it's really led by the Happiness Alliance, which is a volunteer nonprofit providing the tools and resources for anybody to understand how to use happiness metrics. So our latest project that have been um, put in place are in Creston, um, British Columbia, where they have uh, resources, they have money that they need to allocate essentially as mitigation resources and they're using the Gross National Happiness Index to understand what are the needs, what are the perceived needs of the people. And then we have another researcher um, who has used the Gross National Happiness Index, the happiness measure, to understand um, the happiness of people worldwide. She went all over the world and, and used our GNH index. Anything else, Eldon? Eldon is one of the founders of the project. Anything? Okay. <laughs> he's, he's hiding. <laughs> so, so that's our project. It's at Happy Council. We'll talk more about it. And, um, and I'll have a query at the end. We'll ha hopefully we'll have time to, to talk again amongst yourselves. So what you're probably thinking is, what is she talking about? What is this new economic paradigm piece? And what it, what is, how is she defining happiness? And we're going to get to that. So first, the new economic paradigm piece. Has any of you here heard about the happiness movement in terms of a new economic paradigm? Yeah, so quite a few of you have. And a lot of you have probably know, like, you know that, that, that at various levels, why money, why gross domestic product, why wealth maybe isn't the best measure for guiding our society, right? You might know it at an intuitive level. And there's researchers who have actually looked at this, including um, Robert, uh, Lord Laird, 
Robert Laird, who was instrumental in getting Prime Minister of the UK to adopt happiness and to say that he wanted happiness to be his legacy. So Laird has done research looking at what we would call satisfaction with life and affect. So affect is that piece of how you feel. And satisfaction with life is the part aspect of happiness of is your life worthwhile? Do, is, this, is this a life that you really should be living? Is this the right life for you? Hey, Eldon, do you mind reaching into my pocket in my coat and turning off my alarm? Um, <laughs> it's time for me to wake up. That's why we had to sing that song. <laughs> I am not a morning person. <laughs> so, um, so Laird looked at longitudinal studies of what, you know, what, what are people's happiness and then, and then looked at that, how that relates to gross domestic product and found that in, in, since the 1950s, the, the gross domestic product in the U.S. has tripled since the 1960s, it's doubled per capita, and yet happiness, when we think of it in terms of satisfaction with life and affect, right, is our life worthwhile, how do we feel, has actually stayed the same and actually gone down in certain, for certain populations. And that, like, that goes to another piece, which often this is the sort of the most important point when I'm giving talks to younger people. Um, people who are in, in the sort of their formative years, which is called the Easterlin Paradox. Anybody here heard of the Easterlin Paradox? You want to explain it? No? <laughs> Anybody else feel like talking about these? Somebody else raised their hand. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just go ahead. <laughs> What's that? Okay, so, what it, so the Easterlin Paradox. Eldon, you say what the Easterlin Paradox is. Intuitively, we think that more money makes people happier, but the Eastland paradox is that, that only works up to a certain threshold. Um, so that, that slide is for the US. The actual threshold varies by country. But up to a certain level of comfort, more money makes people happier. Beyond that, you very quickly hit diminishing returns. Right, right. And this is actually findings across, the, these are longitudinal studies there. It's findings around the world. And that, that the amount differs per country. Um, but it's, this, has been, this, this research has been gathered for 40 years, and it doesn't matter what country it, it is. Um, if you haven't read the slide, does anybody want to know how much that amount is for a family of four in the U.S.? <laughs> it's 75000 So after that, you're going to get a little bit happier when you make more money, but it's going to be you know, a, a smaller amount. And then when you get very, very wealthy, this is research by Gallup, um, when you get very, well, very wealthy, as you make more, your happiness actually goes, goes down. You actually get less, less happy. So now, this isn't true if tomorrow you win the lottery or if you get a really big raise, right? You're going to get an instant like, woohoo, this is awesome. But within, it, and it sort of depends on the person, between six weeks to six months, your happiness level will, will come back um, because of that, 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 that gain right there. Okay, so there's the Easterlin paradox, and I've already talked about what is a happiness measurement. That's that piece of, you know, what are you talking about in terms of measuring happiness? It's a survey or a questionnaire. Has anybody here taken the Gross National Happiness Index? We didn't give out the link beforehand because I'm going to tell you why in a minute. So, well, Eldon is, of course, he was one of the people who helped build it um, online. But it's, it's a survey or it's a questionnaire, and what it's doing is it's giving you information about how people perceive themselves to be hurting and how they perceive themselves to be thriving. So I mentioned earlier that in Creston, British Columbia, they're using the Gross National Happiness Index to understand how to allocate resources. Certainly they could have somebody come in and say, well, people in this population, you know, the teenagers are not graduating from high school, there's high dropout rates, and over here, you know, people are having a, a hard time in terms of their, you know, some aspect of their physical health, and they could go in and, and put those resources there. Or they could ask the people, where do you perceive yourselves to be, to be, to be really hurt, hurting? In, the, in Seattle, when we did this um, in 2011, and then provided the data to the Seattle City Council, they were about to go in, this is a bad year for the, for the city, they were about to go in and cut most of the community centers in Seattle. And they, we, our data for us found that we were actually highly valued community, which you all saw. 
Um, and so they decided not to do a lot of the cuts in the community centers. So this is, inform this is important information that's being starting to be understood on how to be used. And if you want to learn more about the happiness movement and how it's being used, including what I didn't talk about, which is called the Brain Pool Project, a really important project that happened in the EU around the importance of happiness and what they call beyond GDP metrics, you can go to the website at happycounts.org. And um, under the happiness initiative, I'll show you, under the happiness initiative toolkit, there's links to, these, to this information. So let me show you really quick before we go into the next piece of this talk. So there's the report, um, there's a project. And then the happiness initiative toolkit, if you scroll down, there's essential reading where you'll find all of, a lot of, I mean, if you read these five documents, you'll be up on the happiness movement. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation. All right. So, you all know who the Z generation is, right? Any of you have kids? Yeah. <laughs> those, are the, those are your Zs. Um, so, some of the answers are here. So, what percentage do you think of, these, of the Z generation is connected, is online? 75%? <laughs> 75, 75% of it. What, do you, what percentage would you assume that of, of, of you all, the millennials, the X generations, and then those of us who are the Y generation, are connected? What do you think? I don't know this question I'm asking you. What, how often are you connected? What? 100%? Is that what you said? Yeah. Of your waking, I mean, I think so, right? 95%? I mean, it's either work or amusement. It's pretty much all online. Um, so that's that's the percent of time. So 75% of the of the X of the Z generation are online, and they're online about 25% of the time. And we're online. I mean, we are their models. We're online. What 95? I mean, there's certain things that you do that aren't off, aren't online, and you know what those are because they're the exception, <laughs> right? So, what is the reason that the this Z generation? What is the main reason that they're online? Anybody? Have an idea? Connect to connect with their friends, yeah. So the core reason, the findings are the core reason are what Young would call individuation. So individuation, sort of in a nutshell, and how it relates to happiness, is finding out who your true self is, who your true integrated self is. What is your purpose? And that's really the core of what happiness is. When we look at our Declaration of Independence that says that we all have an inalienable right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, right? And when Thomas Jefferson wrote pursuit of, he didn't write pursuit of property. That was the term of art at the time. He wrote pursuit of happiness. He made a huge departure by doing that. And when he talked about happiness, he was talking about what the Greeks would call eudaimonia. So that's that purpose. And so now we have a situation, we have a different reality where very different from any of human history, where people are connected, there is no longer a complete separation between the East and the West, right? There's no, there, we're, we're, we're blurring the boundaries in all kinds of different ways for human civilization, and we're using the internet to individuate, not just the young people, but ourselves. So when we have a project like the Happiness Alliance that's trying to bring about a new economic paradigm through a subjective indicator of well-being, there's an opportunity there. And that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk on. But before I do, I wanna ask you to think deeply. Let's just give, give this scenario. Let's just say that today at some point you're told that your computer, your laptop, your phone, your iPad, whatever else device is gone and so is all of the data. You don't have any access to it. How do you feel? Right? Go down into how you feel, and why do you feel that way? I mean, for me, I, feel, I would feel like I lost a child. It wouldn't be a long, long, you know, it wouldn't be like my kid actually was gone for a long time. I mean, I know that feeling if, if my daughter did die, that it would be a much longer sense of grief. But the immediate response is grief. It's like, oh, I've lost a part of myself. So I'd ask you right now to go into yourself and think about what it is. What is that core piece that feels like, uh, when you think about that connection? Just think about that. And then share that as you're comfortable with the people next to you. It's like, what is that? Right? Because that's speaking to the individuation part of you and what really makes you happy. 
So if you share that with the, that's a little personal. <laughs> Go ahead and share it with the person next to you. Whatever came up and whatever you're comfortable sharing. All right. Okay, so let's go back, because what I'm hoping is at the end we'll have a good spance to talk a little bit about what it means for, um, in, a, in a systems approach. Okay, so anybody here seen the movie Happy? Yeah? So if you saw the movie Happy, which is on Netflix, which kind of tells you where I spend my time when I'm not working, <laughs> um, but it's on Netflix. Um, and there's a, there's a professor there called Tim Kasser. He's done research on happiness metrics um, and other metrics and what what is the relationship between what we measure and what we value and of course what we value has a direct income on what are the outcomes right what you value is what you're going to work for and that's what you're going to get going to get and so what his research says is that measurements are actually a guide for society in telling the society and individuals what they value and right now um, when we look at the measurements that we're using, gross domestic product, money, wealth, the values that are directly related to that are the values of financial success, hierarchy, status. And that the values that are directly related to happiness metrics or sustainability metrics, if we think of it in a, in a wider scope, the values that are related to, um, to well-being metrics, many of you have taken well-being tests at, at, um, at, at your workplace. These values are the values of taking care of each other, taking care of the environment, taking care of our community. And these values are actually sort of, in a sense, diametrically opposed. And so that if we do, if we do want to have a shift towards sustainability or towards well-being or towards um, a new economic paradigm, assuming that we do see the need for that, we need to change our metrics. So that, that information is um, on that movie, Happy, which is a great movie to, to get people together to watch, and I highly recommend it. Um, you all have our theory of change on a little postcard, and that is essentially another way of making that connection. And sort of our, you know, being very real about who we are and what we are, we're one little, the Happiness Alliance is one little piece in this huge movement towards a new economic paradigm which has been going on for years, first with sustainability and now joined with the happiness movement. I'm sorry this doesn't show up very well, but the idea, and we have seen this where people have taken the Gross National Happiness Index, and we have seen it where they actually, some of them actually do, their lives actually do change. They, they see something and they, they um, I remember I was in New York once and I, I love taking risks when I'm talking and I asked a young, anybody taken the happiness index? And this beautiful young woman said, yes, I have. Um, and I said, well, what happened? And she said, well, I took it and I thought I was really happy because I'm making tons of money and I saw I scored myself really low in community. Um, and I realized I'm not spending as much time as I need to with my family and friends and I'm going to make a difference with, in my life with that. That's one little story. So if people take him, take take the Gross National Happiness Index or find some other way of understanding their own happiness and they can start relating that to what you guys said earlier, to others. Start taking action to make themselves happy and to increase the well-being of their community, right? That synergy piece. And then collectively, if we can do that together, bring about the same kind of energy that happened with, for example, the Occupy movement. Um, and then we can start seeing societal change and there are countries and there are areas that are already doing this to as, as a guide for us. And I mentioned the UK as one of them, um, Denmark. Any, you want to give other examples in the world of where happiness is happening? <laughs> Sorry, Eldon, <laughs> putting you on the spot. Right, so um, we're going to do a little exercise here after I show you a little bit about the new, new, new platform that we have for the Gross National Happiness Index that we'll be issuing shortly. Um, and then Eldon, come, come around if any of you want help in, in the exercise. So um, the Gross National Happiness Index, um, which is our main tool that we provide, has been online since 2011. And over, um, I think probably over at this point, over 80,000 people have taken it. The version now that we have now, um, over 41 individual people have taken it. Um, about 150 different communities have used it. And um, 
we've learned from that that we need a new platform. So we're about to issue this platform, and I'm going to show it to you. Instead of just being a straight survey, what you're going to be able to, ha to get is um, you'll be, be able to log in, create your own personal profile, which most of you are probably thinking like, duh, but <coughs> we're going to have that feature. Um, people will have the experience of taking the survey. They'll be able to get their results in a graphic, and then they also get some information and links on how to interpret those results and resources, which I showed you earlier, linked to the web page. Um, and you all have the little personal happiness handbook. We have lots of tools on the website for your own happiness um, at an individual level as well as at a community level. And then you can save your results with the notes that you've taken on your results and see how they how you track over time. So let's just say that, the, uh, that for example, the young woman from New York, she took the survey, she decided to do something, and then six months later she wanted to take it again to see if it actually did increase her happiness. Um, and then anybody can create a, a group. Um, so one of the things that we had intended to do was to give you a group URL so we could look at our group, Gross National Happiness Index, but decided not to because we're still beta testing this new platform and I want you to use that one <laughs> instead of the old one. <laughs> so anybody can create a group and then with the group URL, anybody can create their own custom questions. So we have areas that, are, that have asked for that. We want to be able to add our own questions, say for example about um, a transportation decision or about, um, there was one area that wanted to ask questions about compassion, so it ranges. And then anybody can do what we're calling a data dive. So you can go through the demographics, like if, say if you want to know how are women compared to men between the ages of 30 and 34 doing in the area of physical health and um, material well-being or something like that. So you can do a data dive. That's a really fast preview of what we're doing and the, the new pla IT platform that we'll be issuing. Um, so, so now what I would like to spend the rest of the time on is asking you, looking back to what you identified as what made you happy and then really thinking deeply about how are you sort of individuating using technology and within the context of the happiness movement, which most specifically includes a subjective indicator of well-being where people are interacting online to understand what makes them happy and to contribute towards a new economic paradigm. To think about that in terms of a systems approach and what does the system look like? Does that make sense? You're all information architects, so you're, co you're, co you're comfortable working in systems, right? You understand what a systems design is. So what does the system look like in terms of your personal happiness, in terms of societal change, towards a new economic paradigm where we have a world that actually does truly care about sustainability and others, that, that understands that money is a piece of the equation, not the end solution, um, and information that's being provided out there. It's kind of a big question. I was gonna make it like what, what's the next step for something like the Happiness Alliance, and I'd like to do um, tonight a little, one, this afternoon when we do, I'm hoping to do one of those um, open forum meeting, meetings on that. But right now, what I'm asking you to do is you have the other, the other side of your piece of paper to draw a system of that with your neighbor, just to kind of brainstorm a system of that. And the next, how much time do we have left, Stuart? Or? Okay, so let's take seven minutes to do that and then three minutes to just do th two or three shares on what, what you all designed. Does that make sense to everybody? Design the system for happiness, for your own happiness, um, and for the ha for the for the well-being of the planet. In seven minutes. <laughs> now. <laughs> So we have we we got two two of you from out of the audience to come up and just speak real briefly about sort of what came up, um, come, what came up for you. Okay, Erica, go ahead. All right, so here's Erica. Hi. Just speak right into. Okay, so um, I guess our conversation kind of centered around two things, like the the values of a community and the systems that would need to be in place to sort of support those values and implement those values. And what we talked about, like, in terms of values that would promote greater happiness in a community were, first of all, um, sort of respect for a greater diversity of choices that people might make. So we talked about things like 
people being able to study what they want to study without fear of judgment, people being able to pursue purpose-driven work uh, without fear of not being able to pay the bills. Um, and that kind of cor corresponds to a second value, which is basically wanting to make sure that everyone is able to maintain like a minimal standard of living um, and not have to live with like the basic fear of not knowing where to get food for dinner or whether they're going to have a place to sleep at night. Um, so the sort of systems that we talked about, like j just a couple of basic things, like a really solid safety net that helps to ameliorate some of that fear and like let people pursue a little more of what they would want to pursue. Um, and then sort of pursuing avenues that would help make communities a little bit more sustainable, able to like maintain these kinds of values in and of themselves. So we didn't get into a lot of detail because we only had seven minutes, but that's where we were going with it. <laughs> All right. And then Jonathan, please come up and talk. Hi everyone, I'm Jonathan. I'm a UX designer and researcher here in Seattle. So Andy and I were talking about happiness and we started to brainstorm some of the things that uh, Laura had mentioned in her talk, like people, activities, things, what really drives happiness. And we started with people, thinking about family, friends, and Andy had this idea of, well, it's not just the people, but it's the interactions we have with those people that's really important. And then we talked about um, where those interactions happen. Are they online? Are they in person? And um, one idea is uh, random interactions tend to be this really interesting thing because when you don't expect something, when you have an interaction with a random person and then something happens, that can be a really uh, happy thing. And um, so our, our like design challenge or the way we sort of framed it is how can we use random interactions to facilitate happiness? And one idea that we came up with was um, asking strangers to, to get like a little card a little sort of greeting card, writing a, a nice message in that card, and then delivering it to a completely random person, and then seeing what that reaction is. And that's just a way of kind of facilitating these random interactions around people um, to create like this little moment of happiness to, to brighten someone's day. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. That was, yeah. So, there, so there's a few things to leave you with. Um, one is that the happiness movement is, is happening. That actually, both of the people who came up is actually research that finds that those factors really do increase our sense of feeling, our affect, our satisfaction with life, and um, probably most importantly, our eudaimonia, our sense of purpose in life, um, making this life really something that ends up being worthwhile. That there is research out there to understand what is that relationship between money and our current paradigm and to understand that there is this movement that we can all contribute to to create a new, a very positive way of creating a, a new paradigm. And then to understand, you know, what it is that makes you happy. And that that's, that's a complex question, um, but that in one word, it's, as you said earlier, it's, it's others. So, um, Hopefully, we'll be um, having a, one of the afternoon sessions to go further into this and to understand how we can really leverage this work that we're doing that is having a measurable, real impact on the world, given that it's a small project. And I'm gonna, I'll be ending really early. So, um, and then the last thing is, what what can you do most immediately? And soon we'll be issuing. I'd wait. I'd ask you to wait <laughs> to take the Gross National Happiness Index and to use it. It's, it'll, it's as it is now, it's free for anybody to use at a group level, um, to use it on your projects, to start using it and, and, and contributing towards that movement for a new economic paradigm, which in the US is gonna happen in exactly that way through grassroots activism. So thank you all very much. And thank you to Stuart, um, really appreciate your including us on this project. And thank you all uh, for being part of this.